Okay, so we left off last time. We had just derived this um, large equation for um, <laughs> for uh, basically deriving the temperature distribution within a fin. So this is the differential equation that we derived by applying um, an energy balance to a differential element on a fin. And we said that we derived this equation by applying the assumptions of one dimensional heat transfer, steady state, no energy generation, and isotropic materials before we apply the energy balance. So um, we noted a distinction between this equation and the heat diffusion equation, which does not have those restrictions built in. So this is for a fin. Um, and basically concluded that we can use this equation, solve it, to find a general temperature distribution, just like we have in the past, apply boundary conditions um, to find a specific uh, solution, take the derivative, and then solve Fourier's law to get the heat transfer rate, just like we have before, but now for an extended surface. Okay, so today what we're gonna do is solve that equation for um, some specific types of fins and some specific boundary conditions. Um, and this will allow us to actually derive the equation that you're using for um, the temperature distribution of a fin for your lab. Okay, so we're just gonna consider for this solution fins of uniform cross-sectional area. So fins of uniform cross-section. And this just means that the fin does not change shape or size along its length. So the kind of geometrical setup that we're going to be looking at, this is for a, um, this could be for a straight uh, rectangular or pin fin. So the geometrical setup that I'm going to draw is for a rectangular fin, but this could apply to a pin fin as well. Okay, so we've got our fin here attached to a base, and the temperature of the base we're going to always call T sub B. And then we're going to have some heat transfer rate, some conduction heat transfer, Q sub F going into the fin from the base, and then we'll have some convection heat transfer from the lateral sides of the fin. And again, this is this Q convection represents convection from the entire surface area of the fin, not just the top. And then the surface area of the fin is gonna be A sub S. So the entire exposed surface area. And then the cross-sectional area, A sub C. It's kind of small, but that's A sub C right there. It's important to get these down because we're gonna get um, even more labels for more geometric areas as we go along. So get it straight now. <laughs> so this is the width of the fin, W, the length, L, and then thickness, small t. Um, so we'll say 
we have some fluid at T infinity and <coughs> H flowing over the fin. And then as we discussed uh, previously, we're typically gonna see if I can draw a center line here, define our origin at the base and the center of the fin. So imagine those are center lines running through the base of the fin, kind of right at this X location, and then through the center of the fin. So we're gonna label that as the origin. Okay. So origin, surface area, cross-sectional area, geometrical dimensions. So for this specific um, setup for a constant cross-sectional area, now we have that AC is constant, the cross-sectional area is constant. <coughs> And the surface area, a sub s, is just equal to the perimeter of the fin, so the length around the outside, times um, kind of whatever length you're, you're considering along the fin. So for the entire fin, it would be the perimeter times L, um, but more generally, we'll write it's the perimeter times x. So uh, the surface area up to whatever distance you're considering along the length of the fin. So AC is constant and the surface area AS is equal to P times X. Okay, so given that, DAC DX is just gonna be equal to zero, right? Because the area is constant, so it's not gonna change with respect to X. And DAS DX is going to just be equal to P. So just taking the derivative of these two. So this allows us to simplify the general form of the differential equation that we had previously a little bit. So in order to solve it, we're having to be more specific about our geometry. So we're choosing um, straight friends of uniform cross-sectional area. And then we're kind of simplifying this general differential equation based on the results of applying that specific geometry. So just writing out the general form again. Okay, got the full equation there. And then we said that the um, derivative of the cross-sectional area with respect to x is zero, so this whole term just goes to zero. And then we said this derivative, the derivative of the um, surface area with respect to x, is just equal to the perimeter, p. So that term goes to p. Yeah? Can you trace out what's Sure. So the perimeter would be kind of the top plus the side plus the bottom plus the side. So I can just, here, I'll just write this equation out for this specific setup. Let's just write this out explicitly. So for a rectangular fin, we have the cross-sectional area is equal to W times T, the width times the thickness, right? It's just a rectangle. And then the um, surface area is gonna be equal to P times X. And if you're using the entire length of the fin, X is just L. <coughs> and so that's equal to X times the perimeter, which is two times the width plus two times the thickness. So two times the width plus two times the thickness. And then for a circular,
cross section. The cross sectional area is pi r squared. <coughs> and then the surface area is the perimeter times x, which is for a circle the circumference, which is 2 pi r times x. And then we can say here for the entire fin, we'll say x equals L. So for the entire fin, x is just equal to the length. Yeah? Uh, it doesn't seem like that equation includes the front face for the surface area. Um, yeah, that's a very good point. So the surface area um, of the front is going to be a boundary condition. And so we're going to have four different ways to treat that. And then that'll be applied as a boundary condition for solving the, um, uh, for solving the differential equation. But yeah, good point. Yeah, so different, different things could be going on at the surface area. You're not necessarily assuming that there's convection. Um, whereas for the rest of the surface area, you're assuming that it's just always convection happening there. Yeah, so we'll treat that a little bit later. Okay. So we have applied this geometry to our general form of the equation, and we can simplify it down a little bit. So just kind of rewrite this. So the second derivative of t with respect to x minus h p over k a sub c times t minus t infinity is equal to zero. Um, and now we're going to do a little math trick to make the math uh, solving this differential equation easier. So this is where this theta comes from. We're going to define theta of x to be equal to t of x minus t infinity. And this theta of x is just called the excess temperature. So basically the temperature difference between um, the fin and the ambient air. So now we can <coughs> show that d theta dx, because t infinity is a constant, d theta dx is just equal to dt dx. And, of course, the same is true for the second derivative. d theta squared dx squared is equal to second derivative of t with respect to x. <coughs> so now we can substitute this kind of newly defined variable and its derivatives into this reduced form of the equation. And that gives us second derivative of theta with respect to x minus m squared theta equals zero. And here we're just lumping this coefficient right here and calling it m uh, or m squared, sorry. So m squared is defined as hp over k a sub c. So we've just taken this differential equation, um, which we got from our general form, and just simplified it by saying we have a constant cross section, and then switched our variables, and then plug that in to get this simplified form. So this is a nice linear second order homogeneous differential equation. And um, 
a little more complicated to solve than we have done previously with just directly integrating it. Yeah. Can I ask why it's m squared? Um, because it makes it pretty, I think. That's how you solve it. Yeah, that's how you solve the this type of differential equation. Yeah, just makes the math easier. So if you remember, the general solution to this type of differential equation is <coughs> C1e to the mx plus C2e to the minus mx. And if you want to, you can go take the derivative of that and show that it solves is a solution of this differential equation. So again, it's a second order differential equation. So we have two constants. So that means we need two boundary conditions in order to solve it for a particular solution. So we'll say we need two boundary conditions to solve. So the first boundary condition we'll just consider to be the case for all fins that we're looking at. Um, and that is that the temperature at the base of the fin is fixed and equal to the temperature at the base of the surface. So the first boundary condition we have is And we're going to write this in terms of thetas, because that's the variable that we're using in our differential equation. So theta at x equals 0, just to remind you, this is equal to t at x equals 0 minus t infinity, because if theta is defined as this excess temperature. t at 0 is t sub b, so just the temperature of the base. And then that is just <coughs> defined as theta sub b. <coughs> so the temperature at the base is equal to theta sub b, which is just t sub b minus t infinity. That's just how it's defined. So instead of t at x equals 0 being t sub b, we just have theta at x equals 0 equals theta sub b, just using our alternate variable. OK. Second boundary condition. We're going to consider four different physical situations that could um, that basically give four different boundary conditions and then four different unique solutions to the general temperature distribution. So the second boundary condition could be one of four different physical situations. OK. So we'll call these A, B, C, and D. So the first one is the boundary condition that we're considering for the lab, which is if you have convection from the tip of the fin. And because um, the fin is operating at steady state, we're assuming that basically all these assumptions allow us to say that the energy in to the fin is equal to the energy out, and that's true at every kind of area, every point along its surface. So at the tip of the fin, the heat transfer or the heat transfer rate that is on the inside surface from conduction is balanced by the transfer rate by convection to the surrounding air. So we'll say that's convection at the tip equal to conduction. So if we want to write that out, the convection is equal to 
H times the cross-sectional area. So remember, we're considering just the cross-sectional area of the fin tip. So the cross-sectional area times the temperature at the end of the fin. So big L, the total length. So that's just saying the end of the fin minus T infinity. And again, this is consistent with our sign convention. If you think about redefine the origin as being kind of in the middle of the fin at the base. And that's equal to the convection at that point. So negative K A, where the area is a cross sectional area, dt dx at again x equals L. So I've written it out in terms of T here. But to apply it to our <coughs> equation, we really need to transform that and write it in terms of our variable theta. So that's going to be H times theta of L. And here we've just canceled A sub C on both sides. So H times theta of L, so this is theta, equals negative K. And then dt dx is equal to d theta dx at x equals L. So basically applying the first boundary condition, theta at zero equals theta B. And this boundary condition gives a particular solution for the temperature distribution, which we're not going to show the um, full algebra for plugging in the uh, boundary conditions and solving. It's a bit tedious. But you get this equation which you saw on Tuesday and is in your lab handout. So the hyperbolic cosine of m, begin this m that we de uh, defined earlier, of l minus x plus h over m k times the hyperbolic sine times m or of m times L minus x. All of that over hyperbolic cosine of m L plus h over m k hyperbolic sine of m L. So here, this is the temperature distribution, but it's just um, expressed as this theta over theta sub b. So we can, just as a reminder, write down here that theta equals t of x minus t infinity, theta b equals t at the base minus t infinity. And then m squared is h times the perimeter over k times the cross-sectional area. Yeah? Can you write the uh, parentheses for the hyperbolic cosine and sine? Sure. You mean like this? Yeah. Cosh of ml. And then in the numerator, it's like Okay, so we generally want to, what you know, what we're working toward with this is to figure out what the heat transfer rate from the entire fin is. So we want to know what the heat transfer rate is to see if we're doing better than if we didn't have the fin there. So to get the heat transfer rate from the temperature distribution, what we've always done and what we'll do again is take the derivative, plug it into Fourier's law. 
<coughs> so for a steady state operation and all the conditions that we've applied to this fin, we know that So for the given assumptions, <clears throat> we know that the heat transfer rate out of the fin is equal to the heat transfer rate into the fin at the base. So we can say this is Q into fin at base. And this is the Q over the entire fin, Q sub F. Okay. So since those are equal, we can say Q sub F equals Q at the base, and we can just apply Fourier's law at the base to calculate the heat transfer rate. Negative K A C D T D X at X equals zero. And then in terms of theta, that's negative K A C D theta DX at X equals zero. We know theta as a function of x, so we can evaluate this term from our theta over theta sub b, the equation that we just wrote down up here, this one. And then we know the cross-sectional area in k, so if we evaluate that, we get an expression for the heat transfer rate from the fin, which is equal to the heat transfer rate at the base, which is square root of H P K A sub C. And note that we are ending our square root here. I'll exaggerate that. And then theta sub B times hyperbolic sine of M L plus H over M K hyperbolic cosine of M L over <coughs> hyperbolic cosine of M L plus H over M K hyperbolic sine of M L. Okay. So that's the heat transfer rate. <coughs> so remember this is all for our kind of case A, assuming that we have convection at the end of the fin. <coughs> There are three more conditions that we're going to consider. Um, we're going to spare the math, but we're going to write down what they are, what the temperature distribution and the heat transfer rate is for each of those three. So the second one is just assuming there is negligible heat loss from the tip. So this is the same as saying it's adiabatic or insulated at the end. So that boundary condition would look like d theta dx at x equals L 
equals zero. So technically you have like negative KAC because you're saying the heat transfer rate, but it's just equal to zero. So you can just divide that out and say the d theta dx at x equals L equals zero. So no heat transfer from the end. That gives you a temperature distribution of theta over theta B equals, the rest of them are shorter, so, than the first one. Hyperbolic cosine of M times L minus X over hyperbolic cosine of ML. And then we have a heat transfer rate associated with that, <coughs> which is square root of H P K A sub C, and again, end or square root right there, then theta sub B hyperbolic tangent Keep going. C is a prescribed temperature. So you basically have something that is just holding the end of the fin at a constant temperature. So that's a really simple boundary condition. It's just theta at L is equal to some constant temperature theta sub L. And then the temperature distribution, theta over theta sub B equals theta sub L divided by theta sub B times hyperbolic sine of MX plus hyperbolic sine of M times L minus X. over <coughs> hyperbolic sine of ML. Yeah? The stuff that we look at with this prescribed temperature be constant space? For the lab, or what do you mean? Just in general, in this class, are we going to, would, would oh. this case ever see a varying prescribed? No, okay. no not, not for this class, no. Okay. And then the heat transfer rate, Q sub F, is the square root of H, P, K, A sub C, in square root, theta sub B, times hyperbolic cosine of M L minus theta sub L over theta sub B, divided by hyperbolic sine of ML. Okay, we're almost there. One more and it's the shortest. Okay, and then the last case is assuming you have a very long fin or infinitely long fin. So basically L going to infinity. Any thoughts on what the boundary condition for this one would be at the end of the fin? Um, yeah, so theta sub L is going to go to zero because the temperature at the end of the fin is going to go to ambient. Yeah. So basically it's not going to see any of the heat transfer from the base of the fin because it's infinitely long. So the thermal resistance, its thermal resistance is going to be infinite basically. So there's not going to be any heat transfer to the end of the fin. 
So that means that theta sub L is gonna go to zero because T sub L has gone to T infinity and theta sub L is um, T sub L minus T infinity. <clears throat> so this boundary condition is theta at L equals theta sub L, which equals zero. The temperature distribution is theta over theta sub B equals E to the negative MX, it's exponential. And then the heat transfer rate is just Q sub F equals the square root of H P K A sub C <coughs> in square root theta sub B. So just that first part of the equation for the rest of them. Okay, so those are our four main boundary conditions for fins. And that's basically as complicated as we're gonna consider for coming up with specific temp temperature distributions in this class. So single fins, uniform cross-section, straight fins, either rectangular or circular cross-section with one of four boundary conditions at the end. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So is so we I'm just like kinda like <coughs> the path from like how like what why is theta over theta B at that ratio? Is that a boundary condition? Um or is that like I don't is it a solution? I so you're talking about because like I know this. so like big picture, we yeah. have the differential equation. Yep. We're trying to solve it. It's second order. We need two boundary conditions. One is the base temperature. Yep. And the other is different situations. But I'm just trying to, like, why is that ratio? Like, how do we get to that ratio? Like, why is there? Yeah, sure. Let me go back to the general solution. Um, let's see. Okay, so general solution. Do you understand where just like the theta variable comes from? Yeah. Okay, so that's just swi switching our variables. Yeah, it's like the temperature difference. Yeah, so we have the general solution here. And then like you said, we have, uh, we apply two boundary conditions. And then, so that's the general solution of the temperature distribution. Yeah. And then applying whatever boundary conditions, this is just the convection boundary condition. We get this um, particular solution for the temperature distribution. And this theta over theta sub b, it's just written this way to make the equation cleaner and make the kind of like the math simpler. You can just, I mean, you could just multiply this theta sub b. So theta sub b is just this ratio of the temperature at the base minus the temperature at the, um, of the ambient air. So, I mean, if you wanted this just to be theta of x, just like the temperature distribution t of x, you could just multiply the theta sub b over. Oh, and then you would just have theta of x, temperature distribution, in terms of the theta variable, is equal to all of this times theta sub b. So that is the particular solution? Yes, this is the temperature distribution, the particular solution. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I just missed that part. I didn't. Yeah, so we'll just write here, this is temperature distribution. That's after both boundary conditions. Right? Yes, correct. Yeah, so um, see there's no constants in here? So we have, we have applied both boundary conditions. So applying um, <coughs> theta at zero, theta at sub b, and this boundary condition, the one that we listed right here, convection from the tip, gives you this temperature distribution. Yeah, yeah so we did, <laughs> we did, <laughs> yep. So this temperature distribution, and then we have four different versions of that, right? <coughs> for b, for this um, uh, adiabatic insulated tip, the prescribed temperature, and then this infinitely long fin. Those are all different boundary conditions, and those are all the particular solution of the temperature distribution for that boundary condition. Okay. Okay, so now that we have all of those, and we're able to calculate the heat transfer rate from the fin, we can start looking at how effective our fins are. So there's a few different um, metrics that we use for looking at the fin effectiveness or efficiency. And we needed to be able to calculate the heat transfer rate from the fin in order to calculate those. <coughs> so
So we'll say, we'll start looking at fin performance. So as we've said previously, the point of using fins is to increase the heat transfer rate by adding surface area. But if you think about a plain wall, think about this in terms of like our thermal resistance. We'll have a conduction thermal resistance, and then we'll have convection just to the, the ambient air. But if you add a fin, now you have the convection thermal or conduction thermal <coughs> resistance of the, of the wall, the conduction thermal resistance of the fin, and then the convection thermal resistance. So adding the fin while increasing the surface area also adds an extra conduction thermal resistance in there that you didn't have before. So it's not always beneficial to use a fin. You need to make sure that there's a balance of enough increased heat transfer by convection to make it worth adding that extra conduction thermal resistance. So we'll say <clears throat> adding fins adds an extra thermal resistance. Extra thermal conduction resistance. <clears throat> and typically, to justify the use of fins, um, you want this metric called the fin effectiveness, which we'll talk about how that's defined, to be approximately greater than or equal to two. <coughs> so this epsilon sub f is the fin effectiveness. And that helps you get an idea of whether or not <coughs> it's worth adding fins to a material to increase heat transfer. If, um, sorry, if it is greater than or equal to two, <coughs> it's worth adding fins. Yeah, it's not necessarily greater than or equal to two. If it's greater than or equal to two, it's worth adding fins. That'll make more sense when I tell you what the fin effectiveness, how it's the fin effectiveness is defined. Um, I mean, it's kind of random, but yeah, it's probably based on some rule of thumb for, uh, based on the cost and everything. Yeah. Okay, so what's fin effectiveness? So this is, so we'll talk about effectiveness and efficiency. They're different things. So it's good to keep in mind, keep clear what the definition of each one of them is. So this is the ratio of the fin heat transfer rate. Q sub F, which we have just talked about. We just solved for it for all these different boundary conditions. So the ratio of this to the heat transfer rate that would exist on the surface without the fins. So basically heat transfer rate with the fins compared to heat transfer rate that would be occurring without the fins. So the ratio of Q sub F to the heat transfer rate that would occur without fins. Does that make a little more sense why this is kind of used to determine whether or not it's worth putting fins on there? So what the rate is with fins divided by what it is without fins. And if you don't at least kind of double what you would be doing without the fins, it's maybe not worth the effort of designing and 
paying for them and putting putting them on there. Okay, so symbolically, this is equal to Q sub F, heat transfer rate of the fin. And then the heat transfer rate that would exist without the fin, and to keep it fair, we're just gonna talk about the heat transfer rate over the surface area that is occupied by the fin. So that would be, if the fin wasn't there, we would just have convection at the base. So that's H times A sub C comma B theta sub B. And this A sub C comma B is the um, area, the cross-sectional area at the base of the fin. So basically how much area on the surface is the fin taking up? And then remember theta sub B is equal to T sub B minus T infinity. And so basically this is just saying the temperature at the surface is gonna be equal to T sub B. That's kind of how we've defined it. The temperature at the base of the fin is equal to the temperature at that surface. So this would be the heat transfer rate at the kind of base if the fin wasn't there. So I'll pull the drawing back up. So just the heat transfer rate that would be occurring from conduction for this little rectangle here if there was no fin. And kind of the goal is always to maximize this effectiveness. So this particular expressions for the fin effectiveness, you can derive by taking the heat transfer rate equation that we derived for each of the four previous conditions and then just dividing it by this H A C sub B theta B, right? Okay. <clears throat> I won't write it all out for every single one, but we'll say E sub F For straight fins, uniform cross section can be derived by dividing all of our previous expressions. So cases A through D for Q sub F, those previous expressions for Q sub F that we defined, dividing that by H A sub C B theta sub B. So let's look quickly just at the case for the infinitely long fin. So for the infinitely long fin, the effectiveness is equal to K times P over H times AC square root. And kind of a key assumption that we're making here that we'll continue to make for this kind of performance analysis is assuming H is the same for the surface with and without fins, which is not necessarily a perfect assumption, but is very frequently made. Um, determining the convection coefficient H is kind of a giant pain as we'll see in later chapters. So assuming that it's the same, once you know what it is without the fins there, and you're just gonna say, okay, it's the same with the fins there, 
it makes it a lot easier. You don't have to figure out the particular H with fins. Yeah. And so that would probably not be a good assumption if AC changed. Um, if the cross-sectional area changed, yeah. H would not necessarily be the same. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, or um, it would be a worse assumption to make. Uh, I think it would depend more on things like the surface roughness or the flow speed, the ambient flow speed. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll look at, on Monday, we'll look a little bit more about kind of what this tells us about what situation spins work best in, and then um, finish up talking about efficiency. And then we'll start on transient conduction. Okay. Um.